morning and welcome back to another virtual edition of Children's Church. Today, our episode is cut up into three major stories. They all kind of connect. They're all really important. And so let's get to it and learn about it. So we have these three stories today, and our very first story begins at the beginning, because that's usually where beginnings begin, I think. Start at the beginning. Yeah, yeah. And when you come to the end, <laughs> stop. Anyways, so when I say the beginning, I mean the very beginning, the beginning of everything. We're talking Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. All right, so God, he creates the earth and the sky. He creates the earth and he gets the land separated from the sea and he creates light. And then he's like, let me fill all this with stuff. So he fills it with, with vegetation, with trees and plants and fruits and vegetables. And, and then he fills it with animals. And then at the very end of all of his creation, he decides to form something very special, a dawn. Humanity. That means like Adam in Hebrew means like human, I think, if I'm getting that right. I'm not a Hebrew scholar, I'm pretty sure that's right. So he forms Adam out of the dust of the ground and then he breathes his breath of life into Adam. His spirit goes into Adam and Adam moves and is alive. Not in a creepy way like Frankenstein, but like, you know, we're alive. And, and he has a soul and he begins living in creation and living alongside God. And then God creates Eve from his rib, which is another crazy story. But yeah, everything is perfect. Adam has Eve. They're just like the best perfect couple, couple goals. And then um, they're like living and ruling alongside God as they settle in and rest in this beautiful creation that he's created. And in the very center of that creation, remember there's those two trees, the tree of life, this life-giving tree that allows Adam and Eve to continue to live and live and live. And then there's also the tree of the knowledge of good and evil the one tree that God instructed Adam and Eve not to eat from. Well, all was going well. Everything was perfect until they met a serpent. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the other beasts of the field that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, talking serpent, that's kind of strange, but he said to the woman, Eve, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So the woman, seeing that the tree and the fruit on it was good for eating, she took, and she ate, and she gave a piece of that fruit to Adam, and he ate, and their eyes were opened. They knew good and evil, because evil had entered into the world. They had fallen. They had made the biggest mistake of their lives and we're all experiencing the consequences of that to this day. Yes, one bite and all your dreams will come true. The consequences for Adam and Eve's failures, they were great. When sin entered into the world, death entered into the world. And with it came anger and jealousy greed and murder, stealing, lies, everything that's bad in the world entered in on that day and it affected everything. Worst of all, it affected Adam and Eve's friendship with God. There was a division that was brought in between them because Adam and Eve had turned their backs on God and decided that they could go their own way and not listen to God, that they somehow knew more than God when all of that was wrong. And unfortunately, everybody after them, all of their offspring, all of their children, and their children's children, and their children's children's children, and us today, we follow in their footsteps. 
I make the same mistakes. Now, there was another consequence that happened on that day. Adam and Eve were kicked out of the Garden of Eden, that perfect place, that paradise, where they lived and walked and ruled with God over his creation in perfection, in harmony. That was taken from them as well. But God, he also gave a promise. As God cursed that serpent, Satan, he promised that one day a son of Eve's, meaning like one of her great, 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 great grandsons, would come and crush his head while the serpent would bruise his heel. It seemed that God, he had a plan to send a rescuer to save Adam and Eve from the grip of the death that this serpent has brought. This video is brought to you by the letter C for serpent. C, serpent. I don't think that serpent has a C in it. Cut. Now eventually Adam and Eve had children and their children had children and so on and so forth until you get Noah and then later on you get Abraham. And Abraham was chosen by God to be the start of his chosen nation, the nation of Israel. And so Abraham, he had a son and then his son had sons. And next thing you know, Israel grew to be this massive nation. And God promised Abraham that the nation of Israel would be a blessing to all the peoples. He promised Abraham that it would be through him that there would be a rescuer to come and rescue all the people of the earth from the curse that was brought about when the serpent deceived Adam and Eve and sin entered into the world. Well, guess what? The nation of Israel, we've just learned, they have a king, King Saul. And I wonder, could he be the rescuer that God was promising? And so we get back to our story with King Saul, who had just been declared king. And they got him out of the trash heap in order to make him king, but that's from last week. So I'm sure everybody's wondering, is this Saul, is this king going to be a good king, a great king? Could he be the rescuer that God had been promising? Well, I mean, if I think about it, you know, the people kind of went against God in order to make Saul their king, so chances are he probably isn't that promised king. But, you know, who knows? We'll find out. All right, so here we go. 1 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1. Then Nahash, the Ammonite, went up and besieged Jabesh-Gilead. There's a man named Nahash, or Nahash, I don't, I don't know how to say it. And so he, he is an enemy of Israel. And he takes over one of their towns, Jabesh-Gilead, and the people within it. He wreaks havoc there. And Interestingly enough, Nahash in Hebrew means serpent. Where have I heard that before? Hmm, curious. Anyways, so Nahash, he is just like making all of this turmoil, taking over Jabesh Gilead and the people there, they come up with an idea. Well, they're just really desperate. And so they say to Nahash, make a treaty with us and we will serve you. Like, make a deal with us and, and we'll serve you. Just stop hurting us and, the, you know, causing all this chaos and whatnot. But Nahash, the Ammonite, said to them, on this condition, I will make a treaty with you, that I gouge out all your right eyes and thus bring disgrace on Israel. Um, that's gross. He wanted to pluck out all of the Israelites' right eyes, all of them there in Jabesh Gilead, and then he would, like, make a treaty with them and deal with them, and they would serve him. Uh, this doesn't sound like a good deal. The craziest part is that the people of Jabesh Gilead, the Israelites there, they were actually seriously considering going through with this treaty and becoming essentially one-eyed slaves of Nahash and the Ammonites. Yeah, I don't think so. But first they, um, they, they say this to Nahash. Ready for this? This is verse three. The elders of Jabesh said to him, give us seven days respite or rest 
from all the chaos he was causing. And we, that we may send messengers through all the territory of Israel. Then, if there is no one to save us, we will give ourselves up to you. What? I mean, do they need to send out messengers throughout all of Israel to see if anyone can save them? Like, shouldn't they just go to King Saul? Where, where's King Saul? I'm pretty sure that the Israelites did not want to walk around like this over in Jabesh Gilead, and um, they kind of wanted their eyes intact. Like, man, Nahash is a brutal, vicious man. To, like, threaten this, that's just, oh, it's gross and scary and awful. Well, the people, they go looking for Saul, you know, their king, so that he can protect them, because that's why they made him king in the first place, right? And so, they do find him in a very odd place. This is verse, what did we got? Verse 5, sorry, I can't see too well. <laughs> I'm missing. Um, anyways, now behold, Saul was coming from the field behind the oxen. Saul was out Farming? Shouldn't he be with, like, Samuel trying to, like, hear from God or, like, I don't know, training an army or something? What is he doing out in the field? Uh, and Saul said, what is wrong with the people that they are weeping? So they told him the news of the men of Jabesh. And the Spirit of God rushed upon Saul when he heard these words. And his anger was greatly kindled. Now, there are two kinds of anger. There is a bad anger where you get really angry at somebody else because maybe like you're being really selfish and things aren't going your way. It's taking too long. You have to wait in a line or somebody takes a toy away and you're like, that's mine. Oh, I'm so angry, right? Well, there's also a good anger where we see that there's something bad happening and we're not happy about it. Like we see that somebody is bullying somebody else and it makes us angry because they shouldn't be doing that. That's, that's a good kind of anger. And you'll notice that in this case, Saul, he has a very good kind of anger because this anger was brought on by God's spirit, right? God like gives him his spirit and out of that comes this righteous anger. Saul sees it, here's what's happening, he gets angry, and next thing you know, he's gonna act. King Saul needed to try to rally up as many men as he could to join his army to fight against King Nahash, the Ammonite. Um, and so he does something that's really gross that apparently was a thing back then. And if you get queasy or if you're like an animal lover, just like plug your ears right now, skip over this. You don't need to know, but it's it's what happens. So, all right, here, here we go. So Saul, he gets an animal and he cuts up the animal into pieces and then sends it out to the people in Israel with the message saying that if they don't join him to fight, then their animals are gonna look like this animal, AKA Saul's gonna like, you know, there's gonna be some consequences for them. So needless to say, um, the people, they start to, you know, show up to fight with Saul. All right, so here we go. Chapter 11, verse eight. When he mustered them at Vizek, the people of Israel were 300 thousand. Whew, that is a big army. And the men of Judah, 30,000. Wow. And they said to the messengers who had come, thus shall you say to the men of Jabesh Gilead, tomorrow, by the time the sun is hot, you shall have salvation. When the messengers came and told the men of Jabesh, they were glad. Uh, wouldn't you be glad? King Saul, he was going to show up. He was going to do the very thing that they wanted him to do. This was perfect. This is great. Salvation was going to come to them out of the hands of, you know, that awful King Nahash who was just brutal and terrible. So the people of Jabesh Gilead, they go and they talk to King Nahash and they say to him, knowing that tomorrow, like they're going to have a big army coming for them. They say to King Nahash, um, tomorrow, we will give ourselves up to you, and you may do to us whatever seems good to you. But uh, little did they know that the next day Saul put the people in three companies, and they came into the midst of the camp in the morning watch, and struck down the Ammonites until the heat of the day, and those 
who survived were scattered. And so that no two of them were left together. King Saul, him and his army came through and took out the Ammonites. And he said, you know what, King Nahash? You thought you were going to do this to my people? I don't think so. Not today. And the Ammonites were defeated. God's people are victorious. This is wonderful. Could this be? Could King Saul be the rescuer that God had been promising? This video was brought to you by the letter C for slithering snake. Slithering snake. These words don't even have C in the middle of them, anywhere in them. Can you come up with anything better? So Nahash, the serpent king of the Ammonites, um, yeah, he's defeated, which is awesome. But unfortunately, spoiler alert, King Saul is not that chosen rescuer that God had been promising. And we're going to find out very soon just um, how messed up King Saul really is. But that's coming later. But we do know who this ultimate rescuer was that God had promised to send. It was Jesus, right? And we're going to share one last quick story about when Jesus had first just begun to start his ministry on earth, where he was doing these incredible miracles and healing people and, you know, preaching this good news that he had come to save them all, all that good stuff. Well, right before that started, Jesus gets baptized by John the Baptist, dunked into the water. And when he comes out of the water, there's a voice from heaven, the voice of God the Father, that declares that Jesus is his chosen son. And then there's the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, who's also God, descends like a dove and comes to Jesus. And then Jesus gets led by the Spirit to the wilderness, to the desert. And there he faces the serpent, Satan himself. And so as Jesus is in the wilderness, he's being tempted by the serpent, by Satan, and he's being deceived and lied to. But Jesus couldn't be deceived. He knew the truth and he stood up for the truth and he came out of that desert victorious. He did not fall for Satan's tricks like Adam and Eve had fallen for earlier. And kind of like King Saul in this moment, he was victorious against this serpent, though King Saul ends up failing just epically against the serpent later on. Um, but Jesus, he doesn't fail. And you know, he, he fights the serpent in a big way later on, on the cross, where it seemed like Jesus had been defeated and all hope was lost, where Satan had, you know, kind of bruised his heel. I mean, quite literally, he had nails through his, through his feet. But then, Jesus, he did something incredible. Jesus came back to life. He defeated that Satan serpent snake forever and death itself. And he told us that if we would just trust in him, put our faith in him, follow him, that we could live forever in the new creation, in the restored Garden of Eden, just like Adam and Eve had lived. And this is going to be absolutely amazing. Man, what a gift. What an amazing hope that we know that even though this world has um, enemies and some messed up things in it, that one day we're going to be in heaven and then the new earth with God for forever, resting and ruling alongside of him, worshiping him, our incredible Savior and King.